Thanks. Um, so my name is Zach Gregg. Um, I was born and raised in Lancaster County, which is just a little bit uh, southeast of here. Um, but I grew up there my whole life, grew up in Leola. Um, I don't know, how many of you in this room know who Jess King is or knew, know of her? I actually grew up uh, about three doors down from my mom. And that was an amazing experience going out and knocking doors with her for her daughter, running for Congress. Um, but yeah, I got involved in Lancaster Stands Up after I didn't vote in 2017. Mm -hmm. So I voted in 2016. That was the first election that I could ever vote in. Make a difference. That I could change the world around me and that the things that I cared about, my values, would be reflected in the candidate that ended up winning. And November 9th, 2016 happened, and that was not true. And it shattered a lot of how I felt. Um, but before that, I was actually raised evangelical and Republican, believe it or not. So I was raised to believe that gay people were sinful, that divorce was something that would get you sent to hell, that black and brown people were part of the problem and the, the, the ire of the world. And this was how I was raised. This was just what I had been led to believe. And what actually got me out of that was that my friend who I loved and who I had met, and we played video games together, we hung out every day after school, she came out to me that she was gay. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. We'll try this. Is this any better? Oh. Is that better? Yeah. There we go. Great. Um, so she came out when I was about 15, and that just radically changed my life because I was forced to choose between is Lindsay evil or is what I'm believing wrong? And I chose this. I chose that what I was thinking was wrong. And that led me down this path of like, I have to get involved, I have to do what I can. And that was when Trump happened, and that was why I didn't vote in 2017 or in the 2018 primary, because I missed the registration deadline. But it was going to a town hall in an area that had been written off. It went 34 points to Trump. And there were Trump signs every single street. And most of Lancaster County had written New Holland off. But not Lancaster Stands Up. They came out, I got involved, and I started knocking doors. I started knocking doors for Jess because I felt this need to fight for my community. Something that I hadn't felt in years. And that's what led me to actually meet Danielle. We both started knocking doors for Lancaster Stands Up, uh, for Jess King. And then I got hired uh, about three months ago to work for Lancaster Stands Up and Pennsylvania Stands Up. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and I'd like to have you all meet Danielle. <laughs> like Zach said, my name is Danielle. Um, I am not from Lancaster like Zach. I am 10 minutes down 15. Um, I live in Mechanicsburg. Uh, if you know where, like, the sheets on 114 is, I'm right by that. Um, it's a very popular place, Friday <laughs> nights in high school. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up uh, very, like, apolitical in a way. It wasn't until I started getting in high school um, and realizing that, hey, like, a lot of systems are actually really broken. Um, and like a lot of my home life was changing and seeing how um, politics and policies were affecting me personally, affecting um, my family, affecting my friends, um, that I started to realize like so much of this is broken and wrong, like this isn't right. Um, and then I went to Elizabethtown College, I studied social work there. Um, as I joke with people, it's basically a degree in caring about things that don't affect you directly. Um, I, while I was in college, I got involved with Planned Parenthood in Harrisburg, um, started doing a lot of work with them, got heavily involved fall of 2016. Um, I interned with them, started doing like the normal intern work, and then um, a whole, whole bunch of electoral work as well. Um, so November 9th was also a super devastating day for me as well. Um, I had gone home because um, I had gone home to vote and everything, and then I stayed up watching 
um, all the boats come in and everything, and just like, okay, please, like, West Coast, bring us home, Midwest, bring us home, Pennsylvania, stop messing around. Um, and I remember waking up at like 2.33 in the morning, my mom and I had both fallen asleep, and just seeing the results, um, and just absolutely losing it, like sobbing, um, because so much would be changing. Um, and unfortunately it did, um, and yeah, it was really hard afterwards. Um, fast forward about a year and a half -ish later, I'd heard of Lancaster Stands Up because I'd gone to school um, in Lancaster County. I hadn't really gotten involved with them and then I had heard about Justine as well um, and knew some people who were like getting involved in her campaign, got involved as a paid canvasser for her with Lancaster Stands Up, like Seth said, that's how we met. Um, just about a year ago, and yeah, was super involved with that, um, and then right now I am organizing down in York County some, doing as much as we can to help make it a better place and break the stereotype that I feel like is often associated with York County, and then um, also doing a lot of work with Pennsylvania Stands Up and some of the projects that we're doing that you guys will be hearing about soon. Thanks, Daniel. I'm actually gonna move this chair away from the host stand. So I don't, I don't want people over here to not be able to see us. Um, so yeah, as Alyssa mentioned, uh, we both work for Pennsylvania Stands Up, but that was a project that came out of Lancaster Stands Up. And LSU was birthed after the 2016 election, after we all saw and felt the emotions that we did. A group of Lancastrians decided enough is enough, we're not gonna let this happen ever again. And so the first, there's a community mass meeting, 300 people showed up. And then we did one again, 400 people showed up. And then we did one a month and a half later, 500 people showed up. And people could start to see that there was a reason to get involved and a reason to do something and not just sit around and wait for things to happen. Um, and because of that, we started doing listening canvases. We knocked every door in Lancaster County, uh, in certain precincts, and then we'd go around and just listen to people. We'd listen to the issues that mattered to them, we'd hear them out, Republican, Democrat, Independent, didn't matter. We'd hear, and we heard health, we heard about immigration, we heard about depressed wages. Things that came up, no matter their party, and things that affected me personally, because I worked in a cabinet shop when I read out of high school. Worked there for three years. Started 13 bucks an hour, and there was a point where I had four dollars in my account because housing was so expensive in the borough that I lived. And these are the kinds of issues that when you actually engage people and talk with them, they come out. And that gives us a chance to come in and try and listen to that pain and to try to change them on the way that they're thinking. Um, and then we actually did endorsements in 2017. It was the first time that our organization had done that. And we ended up flipping the Manheim Township School Board, which was huge. Manheim Township had been red for the last 20 years. And then we flipped it and got a majority because of our endorsements and because of the door knocks that we did. And after that, the next year in 2018, that was when Jess decided to run. And LSU had a round of town halls. And that was where my story started with LSU. They had them in E-Town, they had them in New Holland, they had them in Corrigal, they had them all over the place. And it was that that got new people engaged. People that had never been out to anything before, but who shared our values, and like this room of people cared about what was gonna happen tomorrow. And, you know, again, New Holland was a place where Trump won by 34 points. Three, four, not three or four, 34. <laughs> And I'm not kidding when I said that there was Trump signs every single street. There's still Trump flags flying there right now. But what LSU learned is that we can't give up on those areas just because they're hard, just because it went to Trump. There's still a ton of people like me who are committed and want to do this work. And there were so many of my friends that I would never have met if I didn't go to that town hall. And I wouldn't be standing here today if I didn't go to that town hall which is kind of crazy to think. I'd probably be in California. Because I, I would feel like, well, I don't have any community here. 
I don't have people in a, in, in a room that I can talk to. And, you know, because of that, we got so many more people engaged in 2018 in the midterms. We increased turnout to near presidential levels in 2018, and we increased the vote share over Clinton in every single precinct in Lancaster County. Because we refused to let one area be the place that we didn't engage. And, you know, there was Republicans, independents, Democrats that we got out and mobilized. And it was an amazing thing to see. Somebody like me who was a former Republican, then an independent, and, you know, out knocking doors with hardcore Democrats and hardcore Republicans, it was a beautiful thing. That was what America was all about, sharing the values that we all care about. And that this work too, even though we didn't end up winning in 2018, it was about that long-term work. It was about building those relationships and getting established in these areas that have long been forgotten and pushed to the side. And what I learned through that, and what I think LSU learned, and what a lot of folks learned in 2018, is that we can't write anybody off. Nobody that lives in our district we can push to the side. Whether they're racist, you know, whether they're scapegoating, they have pain that they're trying to express. And we need to, to go after that. Their thoughts on race and that kind of stuff are still wrong, but they're trying to express something. And we need to be able to listen to that. And <laughs> this guy's got great timing. He should be a comedian. <laughs> and what Jonathan and Hannah, as Alyssa uh, alluded to, what they knew is that we can just stop in Lancaster. And we expanded to York during the 2018 midterms, and then we had two stands-up groups. But we knew that this had to be bigger. This had to be larger than just two places. This had to be the whole state. Because Trump won the state by 44,000 votes, which is barely smaller than Harrisburg. So if Harrisburg turns out, Trump's not president. And that's the kind of work that we knew we had to do. Um, and through that work, they ended up uh, getting a grant from People's Action, which is a national organization that we've worked with in the past. Um, and that's how we got the money so that I could be hired and that Danielle could be hired and that we could be here talking to you today. Um, but Danielle's gonna be talking a little bit more about, now that you know like how we're here, how we got here, Danielle's gonna be talking more about what deep canvassing is and what we're doing. Yeah, so deep canvassing is what we're doing. Um, it's a little bit different than normal like electoral canvassing. Um, have raise your hand if you guys have been out knocking doors for like a can and everything. Okay, awesome. So most of you know what the process is with electoral canvassing. Um, for those who don't, it's usually just like knocking doors and saying, hey, please vote for this candidate because I think they're great and I think they help you out uh, type thing. But deep canvassing, it sort of started about 10 years ago in California regarding Proposition 8, uh, which was more of a preventive measure to prevent uh, LGBTQ people from getting married. Uh, and from then, it's sort of a bit more fine-tuned into what it is today. Um, with this, with deep canvassing, it's different because it isn't just a quick five minute conversation. You wanna have like a nice, long, meaningful conversation. Um, and it's usually regarded like, or it's usually involved with more hot topic issues in a way and trying to get people to think about their own thoughts um, and then their own experiences with said population and sort of make a cognitive dissonance like this is what I believe but also this is what I believe too and it completely contradicts each other uh, and when we're doing this we really want to listen to the people their concerns um, just what Zach was saying like a lot of these concerns to them are super legitimate um, and we want to speak with speak and act with genuine interest and compassion and empathy and no judgment, no matter how um, like out there their comments may be. Um, because when we approach people like this, when you're listening with compassion and empathy, they feel heard and understood um, compared 
to when, for example, like I know in terms of abortion, um, people are very hardlined on that. And um, unless, like people don't really change their minds because people are going in very hard headed. But when you meet someone at the door with compassion, empathy, genuine interest into what they're thinking, what they're saying, they're more open to listen to what you're saying as well, to be open to what you're saying and to change their minds up as well. So how is that applying to us here in the mid-state? Uh, it's a, we're using this here in Pennsylvania. It's a little bit different from California. Um, it's been more rural and conservative areas. Um, we're here in comparison to Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. There's a lot going on in the center of the state. Um, and here we are not using it for LGBTQ issues. Um, we're not using it for gay marriage, for trans rights. With the 2016 election, the 2018 election, and also now hanging forward to the 2020 election, there's been a whole bunch of huge issues. One of them um, is what we're focusing on. It is immigration. And everyone knows an immigrant. We just may not think of it right away. Uh, usually, a lot of people, when we're at the door talking to them, we're like, oh, who do you know in your life that is not originally from the United States who is immigrated here? And usually, people have to take a second think. Um, and then they're like, oh, yeah. Um, May, who I work with, is actually from China. Um, most people don't think about it off the top of their head. And with this kind of work that we're doing, uh, we're gonna start helping change the thought process some and the narrative of immigrants being like bad and dirty people to actual human beings here who deserve the same rights and love and compassion that I would give anyone else. So um, no matter, I've, I've been doing this a few weeks, showing to people um, and doing the deep canvassing. Um, we're sure seeing across the board, like a lot of people, no matter where they stand politically, see and recognize that a lot of these systems are broken. Um, and when we bring, on, bring in like immigration some, personally, the shortest time frame that I've heard in terms of immigration is taking someone about a year and a half to become a citizen. And that's super low compared to a lot of other people that I have heard from. Yeah, and just to build off of that, um, one of my good friends that I met when I was in high school, his name's Jose, he came to America when he was six months old. His parents were fleeing FARC, which is, I don't know how many of y'all know, but they're the, basically the drug ring down there. And they forced his family out. And he came when he was six months old, and he came to where I lived uh, in Lancaster's in the same school district. And we met, great guy, I mean, so into music. He's actually in college now for music therapy, and he wants to really help <clears throat> folks that, you know, have a learning disability or uh, people on the spectrum. Music therapy is one of the best ways to help them kind of cope, and that's one of the things that he's dedicated his life to. Um, but when he moved here, his dad, didn't get his papers because they were they were fleeing and they didn't the channels were taking too long and they couldn't stay in Colombia and so he had to come in as an undocumented immigrant and that meant that Jose still to this day is an undocumented immigrant because his dad is scared to go back and try to get their papers because he's scared that he'll get deported especially now after all the rhetoric after all the rhetoric that we've heard whether it was 2016 with Trump for 2018 with the caravan, and that is his daily life. And the big thing with this canvas is that we're talking to voters about those kinds of real stories. I've shared that story about Jose probably a dozen, two dozen times now. Every time when I'm sharing that with somebody at the door, I can see them change. Their shoulders relax, they trust me more, they know that I'm here to actually talk with them and I'm not here to sell anything, even though I've already said that at the beginning of the conversation, you know. And it's those kinds of stories that we all have. We may just not know it. 
Jose didn't tell me until we were out of high school because he was scared. I mean, and that's, excuse me, that's the kind of terror that immigrants are living under right now. And we know that they're being used as a political tool to scare people who don't have enough income, who are scared about their social security going away. That's being, their immigrants are being used as a tool to try and divide us up when really we know that we're stronger when we all stand together, unified with one voice. And that's a large part of why immigration was picked for this because we know that that's such a wedge issue and that we can have such an impact because of our genuine stories. Did you have another question? Also another part of why we're doing this uh, here and now is because you know, it's sort of seen um, as like an off year for elections, even though, fun fact, elections happen every six months in Pennsylvania. Um, I always tell people and they're like, what? I had no idea. Uh, but we're doing this right now because it isn't seen as a political year and what we're trying to do is make a long-term long -term impact, make a change that will last longer than just those 15, 20 minutes at the door. Um, we want to help change how people think about immigrants or how um, people will think about other group, marginalized groups in the future if this was to be used for something else and just sort of see how that carries over into 2020, 2022, um, all of those years that are seen as more election years. Um, and right now, like this area, um, the 10th and 11th districts, are seen uh, compared to, I think it was 20 or 2006 or what was it? Mm -hmm. um, there was maps for the entire state where we are right now, um, slowly turning bluer and bluer. Um, and we want to help carry this momentum a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with that too, we have all that momentum but we're not gonna get folks in if we don't have good candidates and we don't have a reason for them to join up with us. And one of the big things for me that made me end up coming out and vote again was that Jess King wasn't taking any corporate PAC donations. She wasn't taking any money from millionaires or you know people with large businesses. That was not her MO, it was small dollar donors. And that's one of the big things too at the door when we're talking with folks is that we're not just there to say immigrants aren't bad. We're also there to say, and there's people at the top who have all this money and are buying our politicians and have all this power that want you to be divided. And there's a level for people where it's just like, oh my gosh, this is the system that I live in. And that's a feeling that I'm sure a lot of us have had at different points in our lives. That we can see that the enemy was not who we thought it was. It's like the Wizard of Oz, don't look at the man behind the curtain. And there's a couple people at the top standing behind that curtain telling you, hey, it's that brown guy over there, it's that black kid, and it's not. It's never been them. They've just been trying to live their lives just like us. And it's so important that we have that solidarity because we can't win going forward without that. Um, cool, and uh, yeah, we have a big chunk of time here for questions about the Canvas. Um, there will be, I'll, we'll, if anybody wants to get involved, please see us. We want to get your contact info um, and have you come out. There's more training that we have to do. There's some of it's blocked behind an NDA just because some of it is classified information. <laughs> um, but a lot of it we can talk about. So I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more? Hopefully this isn't the part that's behind the non-disclosure. You know, but can you just tell us a little bit more about what that conversation might look like at the door? Sure. You want to do a role play? Sure. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Please. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Hello? Hey, are you Zach? Yeah, I am. Uh, hi, my name is Danielle. I'm with an organization called Pennsylvania Stands Up. I'm not trying to sell you anything. No, uh, that's good, because I don't have any money. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, I'm just here to try and talk to people in my neck of the woods in the area. Uh, to sort of have these face-to-face -face conversations because I feel like there's a lot of issues going around right now and a lot of these conversations are sort of monopolized on television, through the news, um, and everything. 
and you don't actually get the chance to truly hear how people think. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm just trying to do. Um, one of the issues that we're trying to talk to people about today is regarding healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, and just given with the information that you know right now, if we were to have some sort of universal, sort of like publicly funded healthcare, mm -hmm. do you think you would be in support of that, against it, um, like on a scale of zero to 10, zero being absolutely no way, five being possibly, I'm not really sure, um, and 10 being absolutely sign me up right now. I'd say I'm about an eight. Okay, um, why does that number feel right for you? Well, I think healthcare is one of those issues that a lot of people are struggling with, and yeah, I think that people just need, people need better healthcare. Awesome, awesome, yeah. We're just trying to see where people are at and get a better understanding. Um, and so as a follow-up, one thing, uh, if we were to have a system like that, and it would also cover undocumented immigrants, um, as people who are dead healthcare, how would you feel about that? Would your stance stay the same? Would it be different? Uh, I probably wouldn't like it as much. So if you had to put yourself sort of like on a scale where you think you would be the same, like the same sort of scale of zero to 10? I'd say like a four or five, I guess. Okay, can you, I guess like go in a little bit more as to why you're a bit hesitant? Well, I think that people need to make sure that they pay their fair share. You know, we shouldn't have people that are working, you know, two jobs or whatever to make ends meet for their kids, and then somebody else gets them to jolt the system, you know? Yeah, I, I totally understand that. Um, so, when I start going out with some of these doors and everything, um, that's actually a conception that I had, um, but actually, Doing some more research of my own and everything, I found out that immigrants do actually pay taxes, uh, documented or undocumented. Um, and specifically, if you're undocumented, you're still putting into the system. You still have to pay taxes and everything. But the thing is, you know, 20 years down the road, when you want to retire and collect your Social Security benefits, you don't have that option. Um, immigrants end up putting all this money and effort into the system, and they never get to receive any of the benefits. In Pennsylvania, they've given over um, over 139 million in uh, taxes, but yeah, can't receive any of those benefits. Um, do you know anyone in your life who's an immigrant, um, who isn't originally born here? Yeah, my buddy, my buddy Ahmed, he's from Chad. Okay. Um, where, so like, um, <laughs> um, yeah, tell, tell me about him. Um, like, how long has he been here? Do you know what it was like for him when he first came over? Well, come to think of it, I haven't talked to him a whole lot. I know that his dad was, um, some with his dad in the government there, they ended, they ended up having a week. And yeah, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it definitely sounded bad. Uh, do you know how long he's been here? Oh, he's been here for 18 years or so. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, do you know at all what it was like for him when he first came over here? I mean, I'm sure it probably wasn't super easy coming from a different, not only country, but continent. Um, and then having to sort of integrate some, learn the language and everything. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, I know he's always been a good kid. Always, always been a, just a well-mannered person. Um, yeah, I don't know that much about when he came here. I mean, I'm sure it couldn't have been easy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he, he didn't speak English when he first came here. Dad was struggling to get by because he obviously didn't speak the language, couldn't really get a job. Yeah, it's probably pretty hard for him. Do you know what he's doing now? Yeah, he actually works at a hotel. He's the manager. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting talking to people and seeing how 
immigration to our, affects their lives and people that they know and everything. Um, and you were saying with that, we're struggling some to get by and everything. I mean, I feel like that's across America, that's something that we've all experienced. Have you ever been in a position where you're like struggling, whether financially, whether uh, mentally and emotionally or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I had to leave my parents' place when I was 18. Um, they weren't exactly the nicest people. Uh, but my, I had three good friends from high school kept me going through that. Um, yeah, they were they were just always there for me whenever I needed it. That's awesome. It's, yeah, having a good set of friends is always a wonderful thing to fall back on. I know, um, like, when my grandma died, um, I was overseas, was in Vietnam, and I found out she passed away when I was over there. Um, found out that I'd be missing her funeral as well. Um, and this was like the side of the family that I was closer to, so it definitely hit really hard. Um, but I had a whole bunch of friends, close group of friends over um, in Vietnam with me that they helped keep me going and everything, so I can totally relate to that. Um, I feel like Yeah, I, I feel like that sort of thing. Um, everyone struggled and everything, and you know my experiences, certainly your experiences as well. Um, your friends, dad, um, struggling. It's always one of those things that everyone across America is doing it. No matter if you come from a different religious background, if you're black, if you're brown, uh, man, woman, different. Um, no matter where you are, it's one of those things. And it's interesting because we have all of these conversations going on politically um, in the news, uh, whether you listen to like CNN, Fox News, NPR, uh, all of these politicians and people in the media trying to get us to point our fingers at each other saying, oh, you're actually the one causing the problem because you're an immigrant. You're actually the one causing the problem because you are gay. And it's not always that case. It's almost never that case. Uh, yeah. Have you ever like sort of picked up on that some too? Because I feel like. No. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think like especially during like the civil rights era. I mean, that was when people said that it, enough was enough. You know. And I think that that's where where we're heading again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy where we're at right now. Yeah, so it sort of, <laughs> sort of sounds like forgive me, Alan, pressure and blanking <laughs> more than what I normally would. Um, that? And so, we didn't remember to print out a script, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <thought>, sorry. <laughs> um, it's sort of interesting seeing, seeing and watching you sort of process, like, you know, when you had said, um, like, people should be taking care of their own stuff and paying into a system, um, when I had brought in the immigrants thing, but after talking some, you're, you sort of seem to be having a bit like a, change in mindset some and sort of figuring out some because you know on one hand taking care of our own some and uh, stuff like that but on the other hand like I know Ahmed I know myself um, and we're all struggling no matter what where our wheels are spinning and we're not getting anywhere and then you see people at the top with like the one percent and everything and it's just like another pile of gold coins just being shoved into their vault. Yeah, you know, I feel that. I mean, my boss makes more than I do every year. I'm doing a hell of a lot more work than he is. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. I've been there far too many times. Um, so how do you wrap up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so going back to what I was saying beforehand with the if we were to have sort of like a healthcare type thing, 
um, and it would include undocumented immigrants. Do you think you would sort of stay the same? Do you think you'd be different? Uh, does sort of what we talked about some change your thoughts at all? I mean, I never really thought about how Med was going to deal with it. So, I mean, and I know he can't be the only one. So, I don't know. I feel like it might be a little bit different. Yeah. So, like going back, <laughs> going back to that scale, where do you think you would be? Um, you said like four or five at the beginning. Do you think you'd go down some? Do you think you'd go up some? I'd probably be at a seven. So what did people notice that's different than a normal just voter contact? We're out knocking doors for, for Alyssa. What's different from that conversation to this conversation? Just feel free to the pop depth. The depth? Yeah. The time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not answering the questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And a large, a large part of that is because we're willing to like just dive in and listen to their feelings, and we keep asking questions like, "How did that make you feel? Tell me more about that. When, when was that?" And those are the kinds of things that like keep people engaged. It's also like an active conversation um, rather than if I were to just be at the door and spewing all this information to you, um, then that wouldn't. Like people get turned off by that. You can sort of tell by their body language and everything uh, that, oh my God, this person is just talking. They won't shut up. They won't let me go. I'm not going to change how I am. Uh, but once you engage the people and everything, uh, it, people are willing to talk. I think what, Sorry, if, there was an what, if, what if you find someone hostile? You know, immediately, mm -hmm. I like Trump. And you know, I mean, they're right in your face when you do that. So, actually, one of my first times going out, um, canvassing and everything, I was with my friend Dom, and we were going to doors in Steelton, and we knocked on the door, and we started talking, getting the pitch and everything, and he's like, well, I don't care. Like, I'm 70 years old. Trump is the best president I've had in my entire lifetime. And that's saying something. Like, I want him 2020, 2024. We sort of kept at it, uh, yeah, going on and on. Um, and he was like, Fox News is the only reliable news source. Like, everyone else is way too biased. They're the only people I listen to. Uh, but we kept at it some and started talking to him about how he feels. Uh, and he was actually like, absolutely, I want there to be something like a universal health care. I think that we should cover immigrants as well, which is sort of opposite. Um, it was a little bit different because I had someone else with me as well to sort of help with the conversation some and steer it um, in the right, right direction a little bit. But we also respect people's safety. And if someone seems also like very hostile, like get off my door, uh, my porch or else I'm calling the police, we just Okay, yep, sorry about that. Thanks for your time. Have a good day. Just to add to that, the very, very, very first door I knocked was actually back in my home precinct of New Holland. And I got into a 45 minute conversation with a woman who we tried everything. We tried every pivot that we could think of, and she was not having any of it. I think she went uh, a 101 on the scale. So she was at least brought back at the end, but she was still not in support of the measure. But then I was actually knocking into Cumberland uh, about a month and a half ago, and I had a woman there named Kim, and she off the bat was, I think, a six on the first rating, and then when we said, doesn't it cover undocumented immigrants, zero. Went down. And that's the trend that we see normally, because we're trying to really expose those feelings people have about immigrants. And then me, and it was actually Michael Fisher, were out knocking doors, and we had this long conversation, I think it was a half hour, we just kept going and going and going. And every time we'd get a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper, and by the end she was a seven. Because we just kept going. 
and we refuse to let that space be stagnant. We're like, we're gonna stay here as long as we need to, Tim. We got all day. <laughs> I saw a hand here, hand here, and then we'll go back there for there. Well, one of the things I noticed in the interaction was that a lot of the, you gave people new information maybe, but in a gentle way, you weren't telling anybody that they were wrong. Yeah. Like I said, we want to treat them with empathy and compassion, and you can tell when someone is like lecturing you with their own thoughts, in which case you're like, I'm going to zone out, not pay any attention to this conversation. Um, but if you just like give a nice gentle little push, then people are super receptive, usually. I saw a hand in this general vicinity, and then there's one back there. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll go back there. And that's a great question, and that is unfortunately behind the NDA. <laughs> so I will tell you that there is there is something that we're doing to measure that, but I can't spill that without everybody signing an NDA, unfortunately. Can you share that this is on um, what the, the bigger project? Can you start because there is that not a lot of free share? I can share a little bit about that. Okay. So this is a project that's not just happening in Pennsylvania, it's happening in Michigan and North Carolina as well. Um, those are all affiliates of People's Action. Um, and so we're knocking in Cumberland, Dauphin, Lancaster, and York. Those are the counties that we're knocking, partly because they're the ones that are trending the most blue, the most quickly, um, but they're also the ones that we saw just huge shifts from 2016 to 2018. And people are so fed up with the system, and these areas are just so ready for change. Um, and when we can really inoculate against that, that Trump mentality about immigrants, it's shown to be so effective. Um, so yeah, that's the project as a whole is, and a lot of the data that we're gathering, because we're using minivans, so we're, we're gathering all those numbers and then we're gonna be able to crunch them later and see, is there a trend amongst gender? Is there a trend amongst party? Is there a trend amongst where people live? So that's like all of that stuff that we can do um, to kind of see where those trends are. And so we're going uh, back to how this all started with deep canvassing. Um, that was 10 years ago. So this has been refined a bit more and sort of seeing, um, I'm sure there's been research as well done with it as well out in California about the long-term effects. Um, so we don't have as, there's some var variables and variants because it's in Pennsylvania rather than California, um, but it has been proven to work. And that's why when we go out on campus and everything, before that we have a good sense of training and knowledge on this so that we're not screwing it up and that we're doing the right things. Is that a follow up? I mean, then we just tell them that we're a local community organization that's, you know, we have people here and we're a statewide group and we, we're out having conversations with our neighbors about issues that they'll vote on coming up in the next election. Mm -hmm. And then I saw here and then there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking as we were um, doing your role playing and also um, when I do the, the listening canvassing that we mm -hmm. do. Um, what I think you're probably doing is wakening empathy, a capacity that they are, then, and also unlocking their imagination so that they look beyond a stereotype uh, by humanizing the, the people, your friends and their friends. And, and I was thinking as a teacher, I would ask, um, do you have kids? Do your kids have friends? You know, that type of thing that I think that's what's, what helps. It's not, it's not that they so totally change their opinion, but they have a better sense of empathy. 
Yeah, sometimes like when I approach people at, ask, at the door and ask them if they know anyone and they're like, who's an immigrant? Um, sometimes there's a panic and a hesitation um, and they usually think like, oh, I do know or I don't know. Um, one thing that I didn't do was talk about um, my sort of side with immigrants and everything. Um, like I have a story that I go to, there's a family um, that I met through my church who were refugees from Bosnia. And I remember being like this big and helping them move into their first apartment. Um, I actually just passed by the apartment yesterday when I ate lunch with friends and then helping them move into their first house and then being invited to their naturalization ceremony. Um, and what we try and do with sort of like the compassion story and also the immigration story is to really try and paint a picture so that you know like all of the details and you can you can close your eyes and imagine yourself in the situation that you really know the person. Yeah, and I think what you named is exactly what we're trying to do because we've been taught for so long in society and we've been told politics are divided. Don't bring up politics and religion. Don't do it. It's going to divide people. And what we're really trying to do is just get people to understand that these are issues that affect us in our daily lives. And we're trying to tie the struggles of immigrants to struggles that we've had. And that's why we have both the immigrant story and the compassion story, because it just makes people think in a different way. And especially then coming back and asking, well, what's on both sides of it for you? Like what Danielle said, like, well, I hear one side of it is that you're worried about people mooching off the system, but on the other hand, I hear you talking about your buddy Ahmed and your story. And that, and, and the other key tactic that we didn't have to employ here is silence. Just after that question is asked, I've had to wait up for 10 seconds for somebody to just process through what they're thinking. And I have to learn to just close my mouth. Because if you're trying, if you're putting info into their head, they're not thinking about their life. And that's, one of the, that's been one of the hardest things about this kind of canvas thing is that there's so much dead air, but that leads to such a jump in the way people think. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for naming that. And there's pro tip for any sort of situation. When there's silence and you want someone to speak, stay quiet because then they become uncomfortable and then they just start speaking. Um, that's why I learned my social work education is what I'm doing with this. Um, and you sort of see like, I'm uncomfortable with the silence. So let me just start saying my thoughts and maybe like it'll get less uncomfortable. Sometimes you can just say what makes you think that. And then they have to tell you. <laughs> and it sort of helps give you an idea of what to do. I have someone who works with me, I see weekly, mm -hmm. um, a Trumper from York County. And uh, I've just been chatting, just chatting. And the last time I saw her, she was laughing out loud at Trump. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Things change and if you're patient. You're not going to convince them today. Just plant the seed and let it grow. Yeah, and, and that's part of the hope, right, is that we're reactivating that empathy. And we're, we're planting that seed in the soil. And, and we're obviously hoping to jumpstart that growth. But it could be the next time that they're out talking with their family that it starts to click a little bit. And they're like, wow, this is not what I thought it was. And, and, there's, and there's, I know, because my dad's a teacher, there's that light bulb moment that kids get when they just understand how to do math or they figure out how to write a word properly. And it's, it's no different when we're adults. It's just on somewhat, sometimes loftier, more complicated topics, but we, it's the same process, ironically. So a hand there and then one up here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so have you ever, I'm using this technique, ask someone if they have a personal immigration story to share? Because nobody in this room, everyone in this room has one. Mm -hmm. I have an Asian name, an American name, everyone. <laughs> Just a matter of how far back it is, right? So, so has that ever worked in that regard? Yeah, um, so where we were spent a whole bunch of time in Steelton some of the past few weeks, and there was one family, me and Dom, uh, went knocking on their door and everything. 
Um, and usually when we ask them the question of like, if it were to cover undocumented immigrants, usually the answer spikes one way or the other. It, it usually doesn't stay the same. Um, and when I said like immigrants, they were like, oh, absolutely, put me down as a 10. Like, um, and I asked them, you know, you spiked up a whole bunch for that. Like, why is that right for you? And they're like, oh, well, we were undocumented immigrants. We came from Mexico when I was seven, my sister was four. Um, and then also sometimes the guy that I go out with, Dom, um, he, when, I can't think of words now. When he asks the question and everything, if people are like, no, I don't know anyone who's an immigrant, um, he usually goes like, okay, like, do you know like your own sort of immigration story? Do you know um, about your family history? Um, like me, my, my family history is more like Italian and British. Um, and sort of in both the, do you know what it was like for them when they first came over here um, and went through Ellis Island and then how they sort of start to make a name for this, themselves and move forward with their lives in America. Uh, some of the hardest conversations that I've had have been with young people who are completely disengaged and feel that it, it's just futile. So how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things there is it's again about listening. It's again about just really understanding where people are coming from, because I know um, one of my good buddies in New Holland, that I'm still friends with, he is so upset about climate change. That that's why he feels like there's nothing we can do, and it just it puts him in this hole where he just doesn't want to climb out of. Because it, just thinking about that brings him so much frustration. He's like, why have we done nothing to, to stop this? We have so little time, and it's one of those things where sometimes you just gotta let them go through that and I think it was what these, these ladies both said is that it's, it's planting that seed. And, some, and there's gonna be times where you have conversations and it doesn't pan out the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also times where people will rate themselves and they'll say, oh, I'm a three. And then when you tell them about immigrants, they'll go, oh, I'm a zero. And then at the end, you've had this whole long conversation and you've talked about so many different things, but they don't move. But you can feel something has changed within them. And then we have a way to mark that in minivan and then that's also something that we're gonna be looking at um, later down the line, is that did we make an emotional connection with this voter? Because it's not all about the rating. Because the rating is so subjective. A 10 to you means something different to me, as it means to her. It's all different things that we're putting that 10 to. Um, so yeah, it's, I think the big thing is that no matter who the voter is that comes to the door, we're gonna engage with them and we're gonna treat them just like anybody else. And that's just like such the spirit of this work. Uh, so backstory, I'm 23, Zach is 21, so uh, as someone who has been there trying to convince my peers and my younger brother, like, hey, register to vote, go out, <laughs> yes. November 5th, November whatever, um, it's hard because I feel like a lot of us grew up seeing politicians sort of take a preference towards um, businesses and corporations and banks and not feeling represented the way that we're supposed to be represented and taken care of. Uh, but one thing, as we're going through the conversation that really speaks to them is the, you know, corporations getting richer and richer and us spinning our wheels. Like, personally, I have two jobs and I'm still living at home and like having all this energy and effort put out to just go nowhere. Um, and that's sort of something that really resonates with people. And then, um, we, what? Walk together. Yeah. <laughs> we just try and get them to be like, there are things you can do, like, there are doors you can knock, you can try and talk to people. Um, going back to what Zach was saying at the beginning, like, Trump won Pennsylvania uh, by a margin that's smaller than the size of Harrisburg. Um, and if we want to talk about the candidates and everything, uh, I, I do a lot of my work in York County, um, 
Jess King and George Scott both won or got 10,000 more votes combined for the county than other congressional candidates had in the past. And it's about finding someone who speaks to you and, you know, just trying to have a little bit more hope. It's super hard, but that's what I try and invoke in people. Then I saw Alyssa, and then if we have time, we'll do two more. I was just gonna add that. Um, Tell a story, a personal story where I kind of had a big chance of unintentionally with one of my relatives. Um, <laughs> 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 um, because her daughter in law is an undocumented immigrant and has been in the United States married to her son for like 16 years, and her stepdaughter is gay and married and has a child, and they voted for Trump. And I just really puzzled me because they're very lovely people. and. <laughs> So we were talking, and um, how, oh, she was saying how her daughter-in-law went back to Mexico to try and get back in the country legally, um, and couldn't, and then they had to seek her back in again. So she actually left the country after 16 years, went and lived in Mexico, and tried to go through the proper channels to get back in, and couldn't, so she snuck back in, because she has a business and employs people, and pays taxes, so she owns a cleaning company, and employs a bunch of, you know, a bunch of people, and pays her taxes, and so we were talking about healthcare, and she said, my aunt said, well, I don't think, I'm not going to help you know universal health care. And um, I said, well, you know, we pay for it either way. So she said, people who don't pay their fair share shouldn't get covered. I said, well, you know, when they go to the emergency room, they're treated no matter what. We don't deny people health care when they're in life and death situations. And when all the, when we have unpaid bills, that's all passed back to us and our premiums going up, we don't pay that cost. You know, the insurance company doesn't just eat those costs, they get taxed on to us. That's right. And she was like, oh, well then I'm okay. If it saves us money, I'm okay insurance. <laughs> <laughs> totally serious, she's like, oh, if it saves us money, I'm for it. So I wonder if you ever bring in that kind of self-interest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I mean, we're all human. I mean, we like yeah. having money at the end of the day. <laughs> Will you talk to people about how like, we pay the price of like, yeah, one of the things people will bring up at the end, like once you get through all the stuff about immigration and you're in that cognitive dissonance point, is they'll bring up, well, I don't really want to pay more for healthcare, especially if they're for people who aren't paying in. But then that's when you, now that you've had this emotional conversation and they really trust you, you can then say what Danielle said, yeah, immigrants pay in $139 million every year in state and local taxes in PA. And then on top of that, and when you start talking about corporations and the pharmaceutical industry, and then that they're raking in the profits while well, there are people dying down in effort of because they can't get the mental health they need for their opioid addiction. And that just, it just so grounds people in where we're at. And thank you for sharing your story, Alyssa. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that when you're out of the doors, it just so clicks for people. And it's that, it's, it's a moment that I, I'll say, I mean, there's nothing that feels better than knowing that you just changed someone's mind, even if they don't know it. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight, I'll tell you what. Anything else? Okay. I think it was here, there, and then over there. Uh, I'm a visual learner, so I'm trying to picture you at the door. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, does it ever go like, you know, the door slam shut immediately, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you and, and you're engaged the entire time outside their door, correct? Yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, there have been some times where people have been like, no, I don't want to talk to you, blah, 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 or like we catch them in the middle of dinner, and they're like, I can't talk. I'm like, okay, like, just let it roll off your back some. Um, I think if there's like a, if I'm at the door and there's like a screen door, uh, I still do the normal conversation because I can see them, I can hear them, um, and just as importantly, I can see their body and language and see how they're feeling about this as well. So Are you ever invited in and do you go? Not with this deep canvas. The closest thing that, that I've done is uh, we were around someone's yard. She's like, do you want to sit down on our porch? Uh, oh. So we did that. Uh, I have been invited inside before when I have done like electoral canvassing and everything, but not anything like this, no. And is uh, it always a duo? So, 
it, it has been a duo of some mostly that I've been doing, but we've been we're switching more so into the future where it's just gonna be like one of us um, going. The duo is just more to like build each other up and get some practice and get some like outside criticism rather than your own personal thoughts. Yeah, and then just, just to build off of that, um, I think one of the things is that there are some people who are like, I really want to have this conversation, I really want you to come in. Um, and for this canvas, we're trying to tell, we're telling people that it's better not to go in just because there's some legal ramifications there, there's all sorts of things that can happen inside of somebody's house. Yeah, safety, I mean, and you, like, again, when it was electoral time, when I was out knocking doors for Jess, I went into a couple of people's houses, but it was, it was a different kind of thing. This, we're really getting into people's nitty gritty, and that can get a little bit more volatile. Um, but in terms of like the number of people that will slam the door, I mean, I've had, I've knocked probably a couple hundred doors for this canvas, maybe twice. Most people will just say, oh, I'm so sorry, I have, to, I have dinner, I'm just leaving, and you know, we catch people at a bad time. Um, and then but, you go back to those people or not? Yes, we will be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you choose the houses that you go to? Is, are these like non-voters generally? You may have said that. And do you ever go back and follow up even when you've spoken to them? Is there any follow up after that? So that's a great question. It's great, two questions actually. Um, <laughs> so we have a team of researchers that's working with us. And we, I made a universe that included all kinds of voters in the Fort County region. And I sent it to them, and they have all kinds of algorithms and all sorts of stuff that they run that universe through. And then there's a number of people that come back from that, and they're like the micro-targeted for all the different reasons, non-voting, or they're a voter, but they might be persuaded to vote another way, or they're really persuadable on an issue. There's all sorts of stuff that the researchers are working their magic on that I don't know. <laughs> but um, those are the kinds of people that we're talking to, and it, and it varies. There's independents, Democrats, Republicans, it's all the libertarians, Green Party, there's all sorts of people. Um, and it's, it's really to show that we can um, talk about these issues no matter what the party is. Um, and then in terms of follow-up, uh, we will have conversations with these folks, and then at the end, once we get through everything, because our target is to have a thousand conversations. Mm -hmm. So we want to have a thousand conversations in South Central PA, and then after that, the hope is that PA stands up can follow up with them and maybe get them, especially if they're like a 10, 10, 10, then we could follow up with them and say, hey, do you wanna get involved? Do you wanna become a volunteer? Um, and then there's also other other folks that we could invite to an event if they've never been out to one, so that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have anything else to add? Okay. Oh. It doesn't matter. Like we're not looking, the people that we're going to, uh, it, sometimes it seems like people take as a super partisan issue, but it affects everyone across the board. And then people have been like, oh, well, I'm a Republican, so I don't care what you think. I'm like, I don't care. Like, give me the most furthest right Republican and the most furthest left Democrat. Like, we're hitting everyone. Mm -hmm. And then there, and then there. Yeah. Sounds like uh, a lot of what you're trying to do is uh, first, first the bubble. Uh, do you ever get challenged on, you know, where, where, where'd you get your facts and uh, where, where'd we? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, um, we do get challenged, but those are also usually the same people who will then slam the door in your face because then you tell them where you got your facts and then they're like, <laughs> not dealing with you. Um, but a lot of it just comes from cross research of like, who, what are the social security numbers for, for example, the, the uh, amount that immigrants pay in. That just comes from cross-referencing the social security numbers to folks that exist or don't exist. And a lot of immigrants will take folks that have passed or people that they made up because they're trying to provide for their families. So that's, and if they don't have a TIN, to, a tax ID number, a tax ID number um, then there's, then we know that they are still paying in but they're not getting the benefits from that. No, no, oh, no, no, yeah. you, you right. first Thank and then Kathy. You. Thank you. You were talking about immigration primarily. Mm -hmm. And is this your target? Is this, I don't know if that's part of your NBA, or do you try to engage people on the issue that matters most individually to that person with whom you're speaking? 
That's a great question. Um, so a lot of what we do is we'll bring up healthcare and then they'll bring up guns or they'll bring up wages and we really try to just come back and say, okay, I, I hear you on that, but what do you think about healthcare for everybody? And then we usually, every time we'll just keep bringing it back because they, they could bring up eight topics. We're gonna keep bringing it back. We want that number. We want it because we really want to try to control these conversations so that we have like the most clear, concise results. So that doesn't mean that in the follow-up after this canvas that we wouldn't engage with them on wages or gun violence. But for this, we're trying to focus on healthcare as it, and then as it relates to immigration. Thank you. Kathy? I, I just <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, um, we were going to have some sign-up sheets and then we had a printer malfunction, um, but I would love, uh, for folks that are uh, interested in getting involved, see me or Danielle, um, we'd love to get you out, um, and we can, we can start you off in pairs for the first go-around, um, we'll send you to some different turf than what our canvases going out alone are going in. Um, because that's part of the part of the process there is we want to have one person at the door, um, but there's still plenty of areas in Dauphin County, Cumberland County, that we can knock that are outside of where the researchers got back to us on. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we'd love to have your support. Um, we'd love to have you out knocking with us. Um, it's going to be great. It's changed the way that I just engage in daily life. Um, and one of the things for me is that my parents and I have an estranged relationship. Um, I left when I was 18. They did a lot of stuff that I didn't. That wasn't very kind, um, and this canvassing has actually given me a new think, a new thought process about how I'm going to go back and talk to them, because I really want to hear what was going through their mind as I was growing up as a kid, and some of the things that they did. And there's been a number of people from the Michigan team and the North Carolina team that I've that we've shared that with, and it really changes the way that you look at people, the way that you engage people, the potential you see, and I think that's something that a lot of teachers see. But it's also something that's a learned skill, and you got to keep re-upping it because everybody matters, and that's what we all believe in this room: is that everybody, regardless of their color, where they're from, you know, their socioeconomic status, that they're people, and that they deserve so much better than what they're being given. So yeah, come see me and Danielle uh, once we once we end up, um, and we'll get your info, and then we'll get back in contact with you. We're still trying to set up some schedules, um, but we'll get back to you. Um, if you're more available on the weekends or weekdays, let us know that, and then we can record that so we will know when to contact you. Mm -hmm. Then was there a hand here in the middle, or did we want to take more questions, Alyssa, or did we want to? Yes. I just wanted to know, so the time frame of this, like when she's planning to start the end of this campus, like what is the arc of the campus? <laughs> uh, if, if you're so graciously willing to join us, which we would love, uh, we're doing this until about mid-November, I want to say. Uh, the shifts that we go out for three-ish hours, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, it'll be like also a check-in at the beginning, check-in at the end. Uh, yeah, so it's about mid-November that we're doing this. Yeah, and also don't feel like you're committing the next three months of your life. I mean, you're volunteers, you're not getting paid. So. <laughs> so just to clarify, but this is an academic research project that's funded. There are paid campuses. The goal is to produce like knowledge about how we, you know, to produce a body of knowledge that is published about how people, you know, can get inoculated almost right against the re racist rhetoric, the anti-immigrant mm -hmm. rhetoric through personal conversations. So, you know, our work would be great for us in the training, but they're not counting on us. This isn't like a recruitment for right. students. They're counting on us to get their work done. They have, like, they have that plan. But um, everyone, thank you all for coming, and please do see, thank you, Zach and Danielle, and please